My name is Russell Foster, and greetings to you all from Oxford. Nicholas Mosowski was both a dear friend and a scientific collaborator. He influenced me enormously, and he made me think. He made me think hugely, both in our discussions, my reading of his papers, and in his wonderful book, Reostasis. The poet and philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge addressed the fundamental nature of being a scientist when he wrote, The first man of science was he who looked into a thing not to learn whether it could furnish him with food, or shelter, or weapons, or tools, or ornaments, or playwiths, but who sought to know it for the gratification of knowing. For me, these words encapsulate Nicholas perfectly, and the influence of this rare scientific intellect will be hugely missed by our field. And of course, all of those who consider that knowledge and scientific truth take precedence over politics and hierarchy. Nicholas was uncompromising in his view that truth will always triumph. I know we will all miss Nicholas immensely. No more so, of course, than his wife Sarah, his son Sebastian and his daughter Lara, to whom I would like to wish my very, very warmest wishes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stefan Reeves. I was a PhD candidate in Nicholas Mazowski's lab from 1985 to 1989. And I'm now a professor of biology at the University of Moncton in New Brunswick. It's a small francophone institution uh, serving the Acadian population of the Canadian Maritimes. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person for this tribute uh, to Nicholas. Uh, I'm contributing this short video instead. A few things I remember about uh, Nicholas. First of all, he was an excellent sportsman. Not everyone uh, knows that. He was a very good swimmer, 
a runner, he liked to play tennis, and he was an excellent squash player. He and I, we, we played a few times and he, he always managed to beat me. And I have an unfair advantage, I'm six foot nine, so when I pivot on my foot uh, with the tip of my racket, I can reach the walls on both sides. I, I cover the full width of the court, but no matter, uh, <clears throat> Nicholas always managed to, uh, to beat me, as he did most other people in the zoology department. And he was in his 50s. I'm in my 50s now, and there's no way that I could play squash to the level uh, that, he was, uh, that he was doing. Um, Nicholas was also a good supervisor. I, I found that he gave me just the right balance between independence and uh, supervision. Uh, he would uh, let me do my things uh, during the week, and then at the end of the week, Friday afternoon, at the end of the afternoon, he would come down to my office and he would sit down and lean back in the chair and he would ask me, So, Stefan, what have you found this week? And I would show him my actograms and we would discuss the results and we would chat about things uh, in general. I thought, that was, uh, I thought that was great. And another thing about Nicholas, he was a very good writer. Uh, he wrote extremely well. He, um, uh, he was also willing to uh, write outside the confines of scientific journals. He was willing to uh, write more than just scientific articles. He, contributing, he contributed to the News and Views column in uh, the journal Nature. He wrote three books that I remember, uh, one on rheostasis, one on hibernation, and one on turtles. And um, always marvels of clear writing and sometimes uh, his uh, witty sense of humor would, uh, would show through in some of the writings. Uh, I remember one paper that he wrote about how to improve um, running wheels for hamsters. And he was the first author on that. And the, uh, the title uh, of the paper was Revolutionary Science, an Improved Running Wheel for uh, Hamsters. Revolutionary Science, I, I like that. And uh, Nicholas was an inspiration for me to do the same in my own <clears throat> inspiration for my own efforts to uh, to write uh, popular science. Um, I contributed for eight years. I contributed to the samplings column in Natural History magazine. Uh, I wrote a book on fish behavior uh, for a general audience. I wrote uh, articles for fish keeping magazines. I, I, I wrote book reviews. And all the while, I was remembering that uh, Nicholas kind of uh, showed me the way for such, uh, for such endeavors. Uh, but here I am talking more about myself now, so it's probably a good sign that I should end here. So um, here's to uh, the memory of uh, Nicholas, to his full and productive life, and to his many excellent writings. They will live on.
what I remember is that uh, when I was a second year PhD student, um, Nicholas came to, to do a sabbatical in Groningen, and um, it must have been 97. And, and I had the idea, together with Nicholas, to, that, that it might be good to study non-photic phase shifting in ground squirrels, in, in diurnal mammals. We don't know how diurnal mammals would respond, and the hypothesis was, of course, that, that, that their phase response curve would be 180 degrees out of phase with that of nocturnal hamsters, for instance. So we set out this experiment with the European ground squirrels that I was working on. And, and at some point, we had the idea to to have a, a treatment where we where we lock them up in running wheels, but shift that treatment, advance it every day for half an hour to distinguish from other 24-hour non photic cues that may be present in the lab. Now, Nicholas really pushed that idea, and I sort of was wary because it, I had to do, of course, the experiments. And it turned out that uh, it was a horrible experiment to do. Over 40 days, we want to cover every circadian cycle, of course, every, every phase of the circadian cycle. So we had to run this, this protocol over 40 days, and it shifted also through my circadian organization, and I was messed up. The results show that, that, that the diurnal mammals have the same phase response curve as the nocturnal mammals. And, and so we still don't know what this non-photic phase shifting actually means. And, and I really hope that other people would pick, pick this, this subject up again and, and try to solve the issue. So when Nicholas arrived here on a sabbatical in 1997, I think, um, I, I got the assignment of Sergi to find them a place to stay. I drove around with him in my car uh, south of Groningen. Um, and we found his holiday house park next to a lake. Zuid Lademeer, and and he really liked it. He li really liked to watch over the over the lake and uh, enjoy the, the, the landscape. Now, I just happened to have sold my house three weeks ago, and uh, and I had to find temporary housing. And I immediately thought of this wonderful lake area where Nicholas stayed. And it's, as a matter of fact, that's where I'm living right now. And I'll show you the view from my balcony in just a few moments. So here we are, the balcony of my house. Uh, one of the houses where Nicholas also stayed in the same area. And this is the view from the balcony. You see the lake. And of course, it's a bit, um, it's a bit rainy, which, which rarely happens here. But this is something that Nicholas enjoyed, and, and he must have walked around and cycled around quite a bit here. Now, writing with Nicholas was, was, was an interesting experience. He was meticulous in his writing, and, and, and really, really good in his writing style, I think. I learned a lot from him at the time, and, and, and I wish I could have learned more from him. Um, one particular book that I really can recommend, that's this book, Reader Stasis, uh, by Nicholas. And I brought this book with me. Uh, two years ago, in the first uh, conference of the Canadian uh, Society of Chronobiology, and and uh, I, I brought it with me when I visited Nicholas in this in this caring home where he was at at that time, and he was able to sign it for me. He was proudly signing it. It was a bit of an effort for him at that time, but here he, he I have a signed an author signed um, um, copy of this book, Reader Stasis. It's wonderfully written. I recommend it to all of you. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm Peggy Salmon. I was Nicholas's technician for 25 years. I had the great fortune and the privilege to work with him for that long a time. 
and I'm Kim Edelstein. I was a postdoc with Nicholas between 1999 and 2001, if I remember correctly. It's a long time ago. <laughs> I think if we had t-shirts made with our lab, it would say, check your data That's across right. it. That's right. Um, for those younger investigators in the audience, when we were doing the preliminary work 30 years ago, there was no computers. Everything was done on huge sheets of paper with a pen and ink recorder. Everything was done by hand, calculations by hand on a calculator. So everything was, you know, checked and double checked. Uh, but I think Nicholas was, even once computers came on board and Nicholas was, was so suspicious of the technology in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, he was right though, that you still have to check and double check and make sure because there's computer error also. Mm -hmm. And we found all kinds of interesting things and mistakes do happen. Yeah, so. when DataQuest first came out, I mean, it was a miracle, really, that yeah. you could do all this electronically, but uh, it was it was a new program, and I yeah. think we were, we worked out a lot of the bugs with it, Yeah. because even though, you know, it, the computer said the animal started running at, you know, 7.05, it wasn't 7.05, it was, you know, 7.12, yeah. and it was things like that that uh, very, 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 uh, had to be perfect yeah. um, you know anything yeah. he published had to be without reproach so yeah and I think a lot of people coming into the lab that kind of detail got to be a little annoying at times um, so it was also intimidating right because he he so I've told you this story before but the first time I met Nicholas was at a conference when I was presenting I was standing at a poster I don't remember which meeting it was and Nicholas came up to me and he was holding one of my papers and it was covered in red ink. <laughs> and he said to me, are you Edelstein? And I said, yes, and I knew who he was. And he said, you know, I want to talk to you about your paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was already published and he had a million questions and comments and suggestions. What I learned after when I came to the lab is that he would do this every week in mm -hmm. the journal club. So nobody reads papers. Nobody read papers the way Nicholas did. I mean, yeah. so carefully, um, so attentive and so interested in what um, the researchers were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so in our lab meetings, we would read papers, we would talk about them. Nicholas would take copious notes and then he would write um, the first author in emails. Remember this? Yeah. Dear Dr. So-and-so, <laughs> we read your paper in, in our lab <laughs> meeting. These are our comments. <laughs> but really, I think it's, it's people tend to read, just read the abstracts or maybe even just the titles and don't bother to look yeah. closely at the methods and the results and what actually, um, what the person actually did as opposed to what they say they did or yeah. however they yeah. interpreted their data. And that was a, it's a big thing. Um, and well, so, every detail, I mean, you know, in our own studies, whether it was you know, stereotaxic surgery or weekly cage changes. I mean, everything was an integral part of the study yeah. Um, yeah. and had to be taken into account and, yeah. and reported on if, yeah. if necessary. So, you know, a lot of those details that were missing in other papers, yeah. you know, suspicious, he was very suspicious about end yeah. values or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it could affect the data and it could yeah. affect your results and it could affect what you find. So he was, I mean, the other piece for Nicholas that was so important I think was look was the whole idea of behavior and so I think now lots of people put their animals in cages and running wheels mm -hmm. shut the doors shut those cabinets and have no idea what the animals are actually yeah. doing yeah so you know you put a mice in a running wheel and you get counts and you think that the animal is running when in fact it's playing um, or I mean other kinds of things I mean stuff like animal care right that yeah. paper that you guys published where you noticed that the paws of the hamsters were you know, cut and bleeding and yeah, because of the, because affected of the by the, the wheel. Yeah. yeah. And so figuring out a way to deal with that and to take care of the animal was also really And and in effect and then change its behavior so much so. Yeah. Um, you know, just by changing the surface yeah. that the animal was running on. Yeah. Well and just on the sink over here there used to be a it's just a little you remember it was a cartoon hamster yeah. and all it said was remember behavior. Yeah. And, you know, his 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 hope was that everyone would remember that you know the smallest manipulation, that the smallest you know thing that you did could have far-reaching you mm -hmm. know consequences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to think that was that was a life lesson as yeah. well as a, as well as a lab lesson. Yeah. I think everyone that came through here took a little bit of, of that with them.
Thank you. 